Would you join me in opening your Bibles to the book of Hebrews? So we now pick up again our ongoing study of this book. We now find ourselves in chapter 11. We look forward to all that God has to bring to us by way of example from these great men and women of faith. We shall read, study, and then by God's grace emulate. Let's look at chapter 11 and to get ourselves back in the context for the two verses I at least intend to partially treat for this morning, verses 5 and 6, but let's start in verse 1 and reorient ourselves with this chapter. Please follow along as I read chapter 11, Hebrews verse 1. Now, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he, being dead, still speaks. By faith Enoch was translated, so that he did not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Shall we pray together this morning? Lord God, our Father, Lord Jesus, our Savior, and God, the Holy Spirit, watch out over us this day as we hear your words. Superimpose upon our hearts your word, O God, for you have given us a new heart of flesh. By your new covenant, you have taken the heart of stone from us and you've given us a heart of flesh upon which your word may be written. Write your words on our hearts today, Lord, that we might know true faith and please you. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. The entirety of this chapter I will look at as the study of this one theme, faith that pleases God. Faith that pleases God. And today we're looking at faith that pleases God walks with God. Walks with God. You know, some people are interesting the way they go about reading as opposed to others. When I pick up a book, I want to find out what's going to happen at the end, but not so much so that I'm going to skip ahead. But I have found that some of you are a skipper of headers. Some people don't read a book unless they opened up the back to get a preview of what the end is like. Now, I'm not asking for you to raise your hands, but some of you are out there. You want to know the end before you can even start at the beginning. Well, if that's you, well, then you can find out what the end of your life will be like without reading ahead just by finding out about one who has already gone ahead with his faith that walked with God. This man is Enoch. So if you want to know where you will end up. You need to find out where you're going. 
You need to have that goal, that goal of your life. And the goal should be this. To have a faith that pleases God. Notice I did not say to have a faith that pleases you. Nor did I say have a type of faith that pleases those around you. Neither have I said to have a faith that pleases the culture in which you live. I say we need a faith that pleases God alone. So what does this type of faith look like? What does a walk with God that is a walk of faith, how is that designed? How do we go on that trip, that journey? Well, part of it looks like this. Enoch was translated. It looks like translation. Enoch was translated so that he did not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Think about that. How can we read this, though, in just a few short verses without becoming intrigued? I am intrigued by Enoch. Are you not? Matter of fact, I think fascination would not be too strong a word to describe just how it is that my mind and your minds and the spiritually minded person goes after this to say, what? How? And we would like a paragraph here. We would like a chapter here. My goodness, we'd like a book on this. The book of Enoch. What was this like? However, God has only given us a few verses here and a few verses in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 5, and I encourage you to put one finger there while you keep the other finger in Hebrews chapter 11. Bookmarks are acceptable at this time. I'm not a literalist in that sense. But you want both open and available for you for this morning. Genesis chapter 5, we pick up the genealogies of the line of Seth, Adam and Eve's replacement son for the slain Cain, or slain Abel, excuse me. And we find in the succession of birthings and dyings, chapter 5, verse 21. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. Many of you know was the oldest of all men. He lived the longest, I should say it that way. Verse 22, Genesis 5, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God. That's what we know about Enoch. He was born. He lived 65 years. He walked with God 300 years. And then we know this. And he was not, for God translated him, for God took him. That's all we have on Enoch. Well, what are we going to do with that? Well, if you're intrigued, if you're fascinated, and if it is your desire, I hope like me, to have this goal, emulation to emulate Enoch. How is it that we will emulate Enoch? We must take what God said and find out what it means. 
So what is faith that walks with God and then gets God's testimony that it was pleasing to God? Well, I think this morning I will find and show you four essential steps, four essential steps to having a walk that pleases God so that we also may follow his faith and his walk with God and therefore, emulate him as our example. Let's start, shall we? Number one, the first step on the path of learning to walk the way Enoch walked by faith is to understand this, that a walk with God has and has to have a beginning. A walk with God has to have a starting point, a beginning, if you will, step one. So you're not following, you're not walking until you take a step. There has to be movement. If I tell my little horse, come with me, and her feet stay planted right where she was, then she's not walking, and she's not following, and neither are we. We may say we are people of faith, but if our feet aren't moving, and not moving in the direction which God has said they are to go, then we're not moving. So a walk with God that pleases him has to have a beginning point. And you say, Pastor, well, where do we find that? We find that back in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21. Simple but profound. Listen. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah after, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. Before Methuselah, no. After Methuselah, yes. So something happened after 65 years. We've read in the text, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then we've read in Genesis that Enoch walked with God after Methuselah was born to him. So we don't really know what exactly happened in his life, but we know something happened. Now, perhaps it was the changes that come to many of us in fatherhood. That living for oneself and living apart from God and not following him in the way it doesn't occur to us until now we're raising children. Now we are supposed to be, to be an example to them. And for some, God uses that to draw him to himself and changes them into a person of faith. So we could say that before Methuselah, he walked 65 years in what then and for his lifespan certainly would have been his youth. So as I count it, I've got six years left to goof off. No, I don't. So neither do I have 300 left to walk with God. I think we, the short-lived, had better get busy early in taking that step. For time is wasting. Even you kids, even you young ones in, in the congregation this morning, you do not have time to mess around before you take that first step toward God in pleasing him. You might say in your heart, I'm young, I've got time. I want to enjoy life. I want to play around. I want to see what the world has to give. Seems like they've got a lot more stuff going than church does. And let me just tell you straight up, they do. On one hand, but it is short lived. It is not as fun as one might think, and the consequences and price are far too high. And then it's too late. For we do not know if we have another day, amen? Whether you're one year old or 88 years old, you have no ideas if you will have another day. That's up to God. 
But after 65 years, something happened in Enoch's life, and Enoch started walking with God. You know, it's interesting here. I think he changed to faith. I think he came to faith in the faith of his fathers, in the way of his great-great-grandfather, how many greats there were, to Seth. But somewhere along here, he changed. And it's very interesting to me in the translation, since we're working with translation today and most likely next week as well, that the translation of the very first Greek Old Testament, where the Hebrew is translated into Greek, known as the Septuagint, or for some of us, the LXX, the word here for walk with God in the Hebrew, was translated with a Greek word that means please God. It means to please God. Synonymous in the minds of the translators was walking with God and pleasing God, and it should be for us, for we've just read in both Hebrews, without faith it's impossible to please God, and Enoch walked with God And God took him and translated him. You know, by the way, it's a very small group that Enoch belongs to in the entire Old Testament. There are only two of the ancient fathers of faith whom God ascribes this title to as having walked with him, having walked with God. And those two are Enoch, you know. Does anyone know the second? Noah. Noah walked with God, and Enoch walked with God. Both of them we are going to study back to back, as you'll look at verse 7 in Hebrews 11 and find by faith Noah as well. But we're not going there yet. I just wanted to point that out, that this is a small group, and the emulation of a walk that pleases God has two examples Enoch is one. So how does one, if you will, please God, and how does one take that first step? And the first step is a step of faith, and we find it as we amalgamate, as we put these two texts together, and what we find there. Going back to Hebrews, we find that he who comes to God... He who comes to God, verse 6, but without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. What's the first step? What's the beginning of the walk with God is first to believe that God is. And I love the simplicity of it because it is also the enormity of what God is saying. The being verb is. God is being. We might say it this way. God is alive. And God has being. Who is this God that you serve? Jesus would say God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Neither are they dead, and nor is their God. God is the God of the living, for he is the living God. He is alive. He is what we call theologically the self-existent one. You must believe that God is In and of himself, he has his being. He who comes to God must believe that God is. Perhaps I can help us understand this by showing us what God is not. J.B. Phillips in his book, Your God is Too Small, which I think many suffer from, not only in the world, but also in Christendom. J.B. Phillips says in this book, Your God is Too Small, he describes the common God, small g, that people generally manufacture for themselves. We could call it their idol God that they make, gods of their own making, small g. 
And he outlines four different common ones that I'd like to highlight for you this morning. The first is this, the grand old man God. The grand old man God. You know, the grandfatherly, white-haired, patriarchal-looking fellow with a kind look on his face, giving the indulgent smiles as he looks down at man in his sin, whether it's when he's lying or cheating or stealing or committing adultery, and he sort of gives them a pat on the head and says, I understand. It's okay. Well, that's not this God. That's not how he is. The God of the Bible is different than the grand old man. J.B. Phillips also pronounces a second kind of God that men make, calling him the policeman God. The policeman God. Many have this kind of a God, God whose primary job is to catch them at what they're doing wrong, to make life difficult for them, to make life life unenjoyable. Many people don't come to God because they think God's going to ruin their life. Young people, a lot of you have this problem. You think if I totally commit myself to God, if I totally start walking after God, my life is going to stink. Everybody else will have all the fun and I'm just going to have to suffer through this till I die. That's one of Satan's favorite Lies. Let me just tell you this, you'll never enjoy anything unless you're walking with God. Anything. Unless you're enjoying it with God and for God. That's the second kind of God that J.B. Phillips presents. He also presents God in a box. God in a box. This is the private, exclusive God he describes. You know, if you will, a sectarian God. Maybe not God for you, but it's God for me. This is my God. This is the way I like God to be. This is what I allow him to be in my life. And that's fine with me. Many of you know people who describe God in just that way. The fourth way, and he describes the common misnomers about God or gods of their own making, is this way. The managing director God. Now, this is the God of the deists. You know, the deists who believe that God created the world and then stepped back to watch how it was going to happen. He got everything started, but he doesn't do much with it now. And he just stands far away and watches the universe run down. Well, let me just say this. God is not pleased with any of these man-made ideas about who he is. If you're going to walk with God, you have to walk with God as he is. According to his being, we must first believe that the true God exists, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of David, the God of Moses, the God of the Apostle Paul, the God of Peter, the God of us exists and is alive. He has a being, and he is both imminent and transcendent. What do I mean by that? Imminency means that God is uniquely and intimately active in the world that he created. God is not far from us, Paul told the Greeks, and he is near unto us, he even told the Hebrews. And we've been encouraged even here to draw near unto God, and he will draw near unto us. He is imminently related to the world and to the mankind that he created after his image. He is not far away, but he is not a God whom we might manipulate into our boxes or into our flavors of God that we might want because he is transcendent. What does that mean, to transcend? If you have a transcendent athlete, it means he rises above all the rest and no one can touch him. When we're talking in the human realm, that's a small step. 
But the step from humanity and creation to God is one that is of such ultimate degree that it is like the launching pad of the rocket that takes you to the stars of the heavens from where you once resided on little terra firma earth to see the universe beyond and to just say simply and profoundly, wow, I'm small and God is great. He is transcendent above and not defined by his creation. He is in it. He's working for it. But he is not defined by it. He is above all things. That is this God that is. In the beginning, God. You must believe that God is. God has said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. You must believe that that God is. He is the God that is self-proclaimed. I am the living God. He is. So his being is what he is, and his character is what he is. His character is what God is. His being is who he is, and his character is what he is. Isn't it God who asked man the question, who is like unto me? God proclaimed. And what are we to say to that? But the common answer, the only answer, no one is like unto you. There are no other gods beside me, God said. I am the one God and him only shall we what? Worship. You must believe that God is, and that is worship, and that is the first step of the walk of faith. We know that this man, this God is not a man that he should lie, but he is rather by the testimony of the cherubim who surround him in heaven, that vision that Ezekiel gave us of that throne room of God where they surround him and say, Holy, holy, holy. He is. And unless we agree with this, we haven't taken the first step in the right direction to walk with God. For unless we agree with him about who and what he is, we do not walk with him. Even his own people Israel tried to make him into a God of their own, and Amos was sent to pronounce upon them their condemnation, but their opportunity to repent and turn and walk with God. In Amos, who I like because he was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but he was a tiller of the fields. And God called him from the keeping of the fields to go tend his people, Israel. And so Amos went to Israel. Amos went to Israel at a time of their great wealth, at a time of their great prosperity, at a time when Uzziah was setting up such great things they were prosperous. They were rich. They felt they were wandering under God's blessing. And Amos kicked the props out from that idea and said this. Amos 3.1 Hear his word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. And then here comes the most profound question in the book of Amos. God says to Israel, can two, listen, can two walk together unless they be agreed? Brothers and sisters, you cannot be walking with God unless you agree that God is. And you've got to agree what God said he is and what he does. You cannot walk with him. I'm punishing you because you want to make me into something I am not. You want to call on me for something I am not. You want to deny that I am here and existence among you. And now I'm going to remind you that I am here. That I live. And you will get it by way of punishment. 
You must be in agreement with what God says about himself. So if you want to please God, your first step is to believe that he is. Number two. The second walk with God develops over time. A walk with God develops over time is the second step in a walk with God. We're Americans. And for our short history, one thing we have proved true. We get her done. We accomplish things. We don't take siestas. We don't have fiestas. We work. We achieve. We make money. We build things and thumb our noses at the rest of the world. We are Americans. We can be very prideful in our successes over the years. I think God's comeuppance is coming. However, the problem that has been created being Americans and bringing that into the church is that we even want our walk with God and our walk of faith to be done fast. Well, if everybody else is going to walk, we'll speed walk. And you can buy a thousand books in a thousand bookstores across the United States of America, Christian bookstores especially, that will tell you how to walk fast and get there quick. Get everything in the Christian life right now. One shot will do you. And then you're spiritual. Then you're walking. Then it's over. Let me just tell you, that is not the mindset of God. That's not the mindset of the Hebrews that we're going to read about. That was not the mindset of Enoch. After 65 years, Enoch begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God. For 300 years. Genesis 5.22, Enoch walked with God 300 years. Let me, let me just emphasize that. I'm going to do it this way. 300 years! 300 years. And then God translated him. How many years you got? Jerry Gurch once sent to me, and he was so profound, I wrote it on a note and stuck it to the door of my desk. And every time I open it, I think of it. Jerry Gurch says, you know, we just don't live long enough to learn all the lessons that God would have us learn and to grow as far as we need to. But that does not mean we need to be complacent about it and say, well, I don't have 300 years like Enoch, so I'll quit early. Some of you might have just said that, so I just headed you off at the pass. I send you back to the trail, the dusty trail, the long trail, the long haul of a walk with God. It develops over time. Enoch walked with God 300 years. And you know what? We read our Bible. We know this. We know it intuitively, but we also know it biblically. There those of us who have now walked with God from the time when our hair was once dark and vibrant, and perhaps full of curls. Others, it was very blonde and lovely. And now we've got the grays. And for some of us like me, we've got less of it. Are realizing What I thought was walking with God in the first flush of belief in Christ wasn't it, wasn't all of it. I thought I'd bought the whole enchilada. Matter of fact, I thought I'd eaten the whole enchilada. I gobbled it right down. Done. And then, life. Tick. Talk, tick tock, birthday upon birthday upon birthday, and now there's a forest fire on my cake. 
and I'm not sure if I have enough oxygen to get the thing out. That should not discourage us. However, it should encourage us to start early on this long walk. One of the places that immediately sprang to my mind was God's instruction to the Israelites before they were going to take a step. And the step they were going to take was from the wilderness where God had punished them for 40 years. Why? Because they did not believe that God is. and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. They sent 12 spies into the land, and 10 came back and said, we can't take them. They'll kill us. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. And Caleb and Joshua said, no, God said we can take them. Let's go take them. And fear entered into Israel, and they did not take the step. God said, go to the land I promised you. Take the step. Step, and they said, no, we won't go. That's a faith that doesn't please God because their feet didn't move. So they got to wander with their feet in the wilderness for 40 years eating mamana bread and manna burgers. Some of you who know the old Steve Green think that's pretty funny. Others of you don't say, Pastor, you're so strange. Manna for 40 years. And don't laugh. You guys get mad if you have to have cold chicken again. What, that again? Yeah. So there they are. Not moving. And now we go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And Israel's about to go into the land. And through God, Moses gives them these words to start them training their children not to make the mistake of no faith. But to develop a generation that will walk with God and believe that he is and that he is functioning in the land and in the world. We call this the Shema because of the Greek term Shema, which means to hear, to hear. So we need to listen. It begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. But I'm going to skip down to verse 6. And these are the words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when I sit when you sit in your house. Listen, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, So all the aspects of life, these commandments which God has given to your children, you shall constantly, continually, throughout every single day, talk to your children about them and teach them to your children, whether you are walking, sitting, lying down, or rising up. What does that sound like to you? If we're going to give this meaning, we would say, all the live long day, right? From getting up to lying down and everything in between. That's how the walk of the Lord develops over time. And if it's for your children, what does it help you do? Walk before them talking about it, and it reminds you that's what you're doing. He says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall uh, be a, a, as frontlets to the, between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. 
Skipping down to Deuteronomy 6.13, listen, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him. Notice how that goes together. Fear the Lord and serve him as your Lord, your overlord. What he says you do. If you don't do what he says, you get the Amos stuff. You get judgment. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him. You shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. Listen, for the Lord your God is a jealous God, hear me, among you. You must believe that he is among you. Lest you anger lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Is this foreign to the New Testament? Brothers and sisters, men of the church, fathers of the church, grandfathers of the church, where are you going? And who's coming with you? What is your walk? What does our walk look like? Is our walk an Enoch walk? Are our children following in the way of Enoch that they might be translated? The New Testament says very clearly in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Some of you may not know this. If you don't, you need to write it on the back of your hand. Make it as frontlets before your eyes. That doesn't mean you got to have a baseball cap with a flippy down thing that it comes down so you can read this all the time. It means you know it so well that when you look through life, you look at it through this set of glasses. You interpret life through this. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. I could preach on that. I don't have time. What I'm going for is the second half of the verse. But bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. A walk with God develops over time, whether you're going into the promised land as Israel or if you're walking in this land in the new covenant. Fathers, each one of you, are responsible to train up your children in the fear and in the admonition or the training and the admonition of the Lord. This is you. Without this, no one walks with God. What happened to my son? He went off the rails when he went to college. What happened to my daughter? She went off the rails when she got to be a teenager. I thought she was with it. I thought she knew. I took her to church. I sent her to Sunday school. What's wrong? Well, how did you walk? Where did you lead? What did you say? And if you don't have a father figure in your life, get one who will speak the words of truth into your children. And if you don't have children and you're a man, go speak to children in that way. If you don't have children and you're a woman, then guess what you need to start doing? Training this next generation or the next generation will not Walk with God. It takes 300 years to translate Enoch. We're behind. A sense of urgency has to be created from the life of Enoch. If he fascinates you, start today. I say that to myself. I mean, think of this. We believed on Christ. Every disciple that believes on Christ, receives from him the same instruction, right? Come, follow me. Come, follow me. Walk with me. The walk. See, this is how Hebrews think of things. They don't think of it as getting a shot in the arm that fixes everything, having a, a great experience, a moment, going to a seminar, studying the best book in the world about Jesus Christ and Christianity. They don't think of it that way, and we shouldn't either. They look at the Christian walk as a way of life and that it covers and involves all aspects of life. Roman numeral three in your notes, a walk with God involves all all or every aspect of life. All aspects of life are walking with God. There's nothing held out from this. Where do I get this from, from the life of Enoch, you might ask? Well, I was a little shocked myself 
by this, this phrase I found. And the phrase was this. He walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. That's it. That's his life right there. Walk with God and had sons and daughters. What does that tell you about God's description of life? <laughs> yeah, are we missing it in America? Oh, hold off on kids. Who needs them? They're a pain. They cost money. You can't do the things you used to do. After you make your money, then go do it. Had sons and daughters. You know what that means? You're in it, baby. You're living it. Your life has changed. Can I have an amen? You know it did. It was you, your wife, or your husband, and you playing house. And it was fun. And then all of a sudden, there's squalling in the other room. Or if you're poor, like most of us start out, there's squalling in your room. Then you stack them up left like the Schneiders, they're squalling everywhere. And life has to happen. Well, that's not walking with God, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And to man and to woman, he said, fill the earth and... Oh, I was kind of weak. Fill the earth and what? So you do know. We do know. God never changed that command. We know it and we rebel against it. Because we don't see the image of God who is vital enough to put on the face of the earth. Because we're too busy pleasing ourselves. Fill the earth and multiply. Enoch had sons and daughters and lived the life of raising sons and daughters. We don't know what Enoch did for a living. You know what's good about that? You can't say, well, I've got to be a carpenter to be like Enoch. Or I've got to be a sheep herder to be like Enoch. Or I've got to be an astrophysicist. I don't know, by then and before the flood, there might have been astrophysicists. They certainly live long enough to get it better than Elon Musk, I must say. It's about the time Elon Musk gets good at this, you know what's going to happen to him. He'll be dead. But these boys were living long enough to get a lot done. I say to you, a walk with God involves every aspect or all aspects of life because Enoch had sons and daughters, which equals a normal life. He was filling the earth and multiplying. You know, when we imagine a walk with God, what do we imagine? And when you first read this, Enoch walk with God, what, what is the picture that perhaps sprang into your brain? And I think for most of it, it might be something like this. Well, if he walked with God, then it was like, you know, sort of like, uh, honey, I'm going for a walk. <laughs> Walks out of the house, and then I'm going for a walk with God, right? The house is behind, the kids are behind, the job's behind, and he goes out by himself to walk with God. And that's how we see it, right? So, so, so we get this picture in our mind. To walk with God means not doing anything but walking by myself. But that is absolutely foreign to the Old Testament description of walking with God. It is completely aligned with the errors of Catholicism, of monasticism, of separating yourself from the world, looking for some experience or some outside the normal life that will make you closer to God. And guess what happens every time we try to do that? Sin is multiplied and holiness is undermined and the walk stops. Because we haven't understood what walking with God means. I'm a little fired up, can you tell? This is so vital for us to get in our Christianity lest we live a compartmentalized life that separates our Christianity and our walk with God from everything else we do in our life as though they are incongruous, non-parallel. 
when everything we learn about this, this God who is, and what he wants us to do in walking with him is to do it with him. You know, we might think, well, to walk with God, I've got to go for a walk early in the morning. Or maybe I'll take a walk with God late in the afternoon. And that is great and fine and should be done. But that's not a full walk with God. That's, well, that's just a little respite. That's not walking. If we truly want to walk as Enoch did, we need to understand this way of walking that a Hebrew would understand. And it's not a form of exercise just to be done once a day and set aside. Letter A under Roman numeral 3 in your notes says, Walking with God as a lifestyle. The walk with God in every aspect of this is walking with God as a lifestyle. And when I reveal this to you, you're going to know you already knew this. And I bring you to the very first psalm, Psalm 1. I'm going to start the psalms. Let's start with the first step. What's first? This. Blessings. You want to be blessed? You want to walk with God? Here it is. Blessed is the man who walks, listen, that means his way of life, walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Look at the different aspects of all of life that are encapsulated in the knots. So if these are happening in your life, if you're standing in the path of sinners, means going the way they're going, if you're sitting in the seat of the scornful, which means sitting like judge over the world, <laughs> we know you don't, and agreeing with them, if you're taking counsel from the ungodly, you know, you don't need a self-help book from a guy who isn't following Jesus. I don't care how rich he is. And that includes Joel Osteen. Forgive me, Jesus. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the paths of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scorn, scornful. Listen, but his delight, listen, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates. How long? Day and what? How long is that? Well, that's day and night. That's 24-7. They didn't say it that way. They said it this way. Meditates day and night. Listen, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Did you hear me? Whatever he does shall prosper. Did you hear me? Whatever he does. This is doing. The life of Christianity, the life of walking with God is doing for God, everything with the meditations of God before us and the teaching of all our children and everyone around us constantly. That's what we need to fix church. That's what we need to fix us. That's what we need to affect the world. No walk, no influence. How are we different? The ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment of sinners, in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way, the pattern of life. The Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So, pastor, what is this walk with God? What is this walk with God? Let me give you a few examples. It's the Christian carpenter who takes his framing handle, his framing hammer off, off of his tool belt. He goes to the two-by-fours. He's carefully laid out for the wall. He takes a spike from his pouch. With one swing, he expertly sinks it home. 
and another, and another, and another, till the wall is finished. And he thinks of God, who has made his hands, who has given him the skill over the years to do this thing well, to frame a new wall and to make a house, an offering of his skill, of his ability to the Lord, and a witness to those who will live in that home. His craft is his walk, and he walks with God. We look to the farmer who hooks his tractor to the toolbar and cultivates the field. He returns for the cedar and fills it with wheat, goes back to the field and sows it in the ground. He thinks of the Lord who provides the rain and treats him for his blessing and thanks him that he has this privilege to live where he does and to do this job on the land that God has given. And he waits on the Lord for rain. He walks with God. We think of the mother who changes the endless succession of diapers as her and her husband are filling the earth and multiplying. She mentally makes a plan for supper even while she's making the sandwiches for lunch. She hears the buzzer in the laundry room go off, reminding her that there's clothes to fold. And she answers the never-ending succession of questions that come her way, the most annoying but the most profitable of which is, why, mommy, why? And she tells them of the Lord. While she folds clothes. While she lays them down for a nap. When she gets them up and sets them a task for their hands to learn to work like mommy and daddy. And she offers them up as an offering to him, praying, Lord, make these children yours. May they follow the way of truth. May they walk with you. This is a normal life and it's walking with the Lord. The Proverbs say very clearly, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Walking. We walk in a world filled with men. Men, women, children. We work in a world among them. We walk in such a way that God is pleased because we trust God to do something with our work when we offer it to him. Prayer? Indeed, yes. It was my father, the mechanic, who reminded me always, when I can't figure how to put it back together or get it fixed, I stop and I pray. That's one of the greatest gifts my father ever gave me. And he said, you know what? I always figure out how to do it after I pray. He didn't quit working on the job. He gave it to God. What is the walk? Micah tells us, He has shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is the last part of this sermon. The rest will finish. To do justly requires living with people. We always do justly to ourselves or unjustly giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt. This says do justly. That means to yourself and others. It assumes 
living life. To love mercy. If you're going to love mercy, you've got to have somebody who's transgressed against you to give them mercy. That involves living with people and to walk humbly with your God that is believing that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now we're walking. There's more to come next week. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, seek us that we may be found. Lord, give us hearts that seek you for you are near. Let us take these steps of belief of faith of an offering of our entirety of our lives to you, O oh Lord God, every step we take. May we understand that you will take it with us and reward us in this walk of faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.